All right, good to see everybody here this evening. Welcome to the midweek service, and uh, good to see you in your place tonight. Let's start by singing together, all right? Take your songbook, turn over to 327. Springs of living water, I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, 327. Once you have it, let's stand together, and let's sing it, Brother Bob will lead us. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? can be satisfied. I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. Good singing tonight. Good to see you here. What a beautifully cool day, wasn't it? And uh, nice to open the windows up and uh, it's good, uh, good all the way around, even good sleeping, amen? Not during church sleeping, I mean later on tonight, all right? And uh, it's good to be in church tonight, glad you're here, looking forward to a good service together. Let's open with prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer tonight. We thank you for another opportunity to gather together here and thank you for, Lord, people who come to church in the middle of the week and want to be around the people of God. And Lord, thank you for people who love the Lord for they help us to serve the Lord. And Lord, we pray that you'll guide and direct in our service here this evening, that you'll make it exactly what you would like it to be and what you know we need it to be. And so, Lord, help us and encourage us and strengthen us because we were gathered together here this evening. Uh, quench our thirsty souls. Let us drink this evening from the word of God and let it be a spring of living water to us. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 109, number 109. Would you turn with me to sing number 109? Send the light, there's a call comes ringing for the restless wave. Let's sing that first together. There's a call comes ringing or the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light.
Brother Neil a couple extra seconds this evening to get up here. Yeah. That's top speed right there. There we go. <laughs> All right, Brother Neil. All righty. This evening's uh, missionary message is from the Overtons, uh, missionaries to uh, India with Worldview. This is their April, May 2016 Overton update. Gather all nations and tongues. Our time in the States has been very different than what we expected, but very rich in the Lord. These last two months, God has continually yet graciously prepared us for the 2016-2017 school year in India. He says in Isaiah, I will gather all nations and tongues, and we shall come and see my glory. Wow, to get to be part of his plan by educating nationals in linguistically based Bible translation, and we are ready to return to Worldview India on June 8th, which is today. To teach the second year in Hinsha, Baswa, Gang, Rebok, and Tanya. Oh, how we miss these precious students and prayed for their protection over the break. This week is our annual Worldview Conference in Indiana, where dozens of Bible translators and those with a heart of Bible translation gather for technical and biblically inspiring messages. Our keynote speakers this year are dear friends Dr. Chor Charles Keen, Dr. Bill Patterson, along with Margaret Stinger, Jay Fabian, and Bible Works instructors. This meeting is a highlight for our year, and we are amazed that we should be stateside for this conference every year. During April and May, we've had the opportunity to connect with several supporting churches, present worldview in new churches, sing at, sing at special events, uh, finish homeschool, support our children in various activities, sports, music, drama, continuous work on MDIV, treat some medical conditions, and physically, emotionally, and spiritually give both Jamie and Tori extended families Isaiah 51 and 52 challenge us to awake, awake, put on strength. As you pray for God, strengthen us for the demands of being a Christian soldier. We are praying for the same, each of you. Several times these last eight weeks, Torek and the kids and I have reminisced about all our supporting churches and families, from New Mexico to Colorado to Texas to Alabama to Florida, Virginia, the Carolinas, to Ohio, Indiana, Maryland, Illinois, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and all the worldwide prayer partners, we are truly nurtured and edified by you. Remember every house we stayed in, the fun laughs, adventures, and tears we've shared with around your tables. Now, by God's grace, we're off to India again to uh, minister in your stead. We may be faithful servants this school year June 15th through March 10th, that's, that's a long year, <laughs> because he is worthy, Missionary James Overton. Amen. And pray for safety for them. They're uh, in the air as we speak and uh, ready on their way back to India. And so we appreciate the Overtons and uh, their ministry and uh, their, their training the people who will be translating the scripture. And uh, that's a vital, vital work that they do there. And uh, we praise the Lord for them. All right. Take your uh, prayer guide, if you would. <clears throat> Anybody need one? Anybody not have one that you want to get one? Okay, good. Good job, fellas. Well, the coming events. We'll be down at CRC tomorrow night for the Are You Inside? And then, of course, <clears throat> uh, back here Friday night with Are You? Uh, Reformers Unimus here at the church. And. Saturday morning at London, and also the bus visitation and soul winning at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, Friday morning, uh, the rest of us are leaving. The Jarvises have already gone. They're on their way. Um, the Reeds are leaving tomorrow morning, and the rest of us are leaving Friday morning, all right? Uh, everyone going will be here at 5 by 5.30 a.m., and we'll have everything loaded up and pulling out by 6 a.m. on Friday. And uh, the goal will be to hit El Paso by around noon on Saturday. Okay, a uh, long trip. Okay, it's going to be great, but we appreciate you praying for the uh, 
all of us who travel uh, as we go out for the missions trip and that God will give us a very fruitful and profitable week there. <coughs> and of course Sunday you'll have Pastor Tim Nip here from Lancaster Baptist Church and you'll really enjoy Brother Nip. Uh, he'll be here all day long with you on Sunday and then next Wednesday night you'll get to have Brother Eddie Hamby here. He's always a favorite of ours and uh, uh, I think Eddie was saved in this church, called to preach in this church, and uh, served God here for many years with his family, and uh, he's, uh, he, he, he enjoys coming, and we sure enjoy having him uh, here. Then our father-son barbecue, make sure you sign up for that, fellas. That's on 5 o'clock on June the 18th, all right? Uh, don't miss out on that. We'll have a good time together on the father-son barbecue, okay? Um, on the inside, we uh, good report from the prison uh, both Thursday and Saturday with new men attending and men being saved and uh, good attendance. God's doing some great things there <coughs> in the prisons. And then uh, pray for these on the uh, hospital list and uh, continue. Anybody have a recent update on Diane Stiltner? I know everything went well with her surgery yesterday and uh, she was doing well in recovery last night and uh, I'm not sure how long she'll be in the hospital what's today the 8th I think the 11th what's that Saturday Saturday she flies to be with her daughter in Myrtle Beach at least that's the plan okay <coughs> and uh, you point at somebody Friday okay <laughs> wow okay and uh, but pray for pray for Diane and her recovery there <coughs> I also pray for Pray for uh, Vanessa Bishop, if you see her name there. That is, uh, some of you remember Marietta Kaufman. That's her granddaughter, uh, Jim and Vicki's daughter, Jim and Vicki Bishop. They minister in uh, West Virginia. She had a tumor removed uh, from the stem of her brain at John Hopkins Hospital up in New York. And uh, everything went well with the surgery, and she's getting better day by day with recovery. They're, they're updating on Facebook. Uh, with that and so we, we praise the Lord for that uh, pray that she'll continue to improve and recover and uh, pray that the tumor will not be cancerous okay and uh, I know that they appreciate you praying for her and for recovery uh, Stacy Anderson uh, Stacy is on dialysis uh, she's in California <coughs> so continue to pray for Stacy I have if you need an address we'll, we'll have an address did did Sunday bulletin get printed yet Okay, let's make sure we put her address in there somewhere, all right? We're going to put an address for Stacy. It's uh, through her daughter, Christiana, uh, in California. So if you want to send Stacy a card, let her know you're praying for her and thinking about her, we'll make sure you have that address, okay? And uh, if you want to do something sooner, uh, I think Kay Wallace has her address, so you can check with her. Okay, you have cards? Okay, all right. If you need that address, you can see Kay, all right? <coughs> and, uh, let Stacy know we're thinking of her, okay? Um, continue to pray for these in authority, and of course, these in our military and uh, those battling cancer. And of course, this salvation list of loved ones and friends and family. Uh, we're praying for those to receive Christ as their Savior. And then the unreached people groups of the world, and uh, these who have yet to hear the Word of God, yet to hear about Jesus, want to pray for them. And then, of course, our missionary family, and uh, highlighted by the Overtons this evening. And, um, Brother, as we said, Sunday evening, Brother Yoder and <coughs> Brother Fowler, who went with him from uh, Fellowship Baptist up in Canton, arrived safely uh, there in Armenia. They had a good day soul winning yesterday. Uh, they went to, a, I think, a little... Uh, city, village, whatever we call that, about 45 minutes from <coughs> Yerevan where they're staying. And uh, they had six that received Christ as their Savior there and uh, answered a prayer, really. It's been raining the last couple of days, and uh, they spent some time in prayer and visiting some monasteries today. And uh, appreciate the updates, uh, by the way, Terry. Thank you. And uh, getting those daily. So that's uh, things are moving along. Things are going well. Uh, the first Bible uh, have some men there, and uh, they're holding a conference, and they're uh, training where they can help out and participate with that as well. So it's uh, things are going well for them. Continue to pray for everyone there in Armenia. All right. Well, let's go to prayer then this evening, if we will. And um, so, want to come lead us in prayer, Brother Wallace? You look like a good candidate, and uh, why don't you lead us in our prayer this evening?
And uh, we'll have Bob lead us audibly while we pray along with him silently. And let's unite our hearts together in prayer tonight. All right, Brother Wallace? Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you for being such a great God. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to your throne room. Lord, we realize that it's never closed to us. If it's closed, it's because of sin in our life. So forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, Lord, and hear our prayer. Lord, there's uh, besetting sins, unknown sins. Uh, Lord, we repent of those, and we always uh, want your ear to hear our request because we request uh, the needs of people who, who need your help. We are a needy people. Uh, Lord, that's the way you created us, and, and Lord, you created us to rely on you, to cry out to you, and uh, Lord, uh, to depend on you. And Father, we do that in showing that our prayer is important, but showing that who we're praying to is more important. And Father, we know who we pray to. We pray to the only true living God, one that we know is the great physician, one that we know that can heal and answer prayer in every situation. And Father, I do pray for these missionaries on our list. And Lord, I pray for you especially for Brother Yoder and Brother Moreland and Brother uh, Fowler, Lord, and those people over there that are trying to get your gospel to the world. And Lord, I know you're doing everything you can to open up doors and in our hearts and in, in, in the uh, hearts of some of us men. We always want it to be faster or quicker, but Lord, we have to be patient and wait on your timing, and that's not easy. So give us the patience to wait as you work out these things, just as you open doors to to certain uh, uh, ministries for us here in the RU ministry and you open up doors to certain institutions and Father I do pray you working on people's hearts to stand up and and uh, be a, a willing servant. Lord even back in the Old Testament when you were giving out the orders how to build the temple you specified that you wanted willing people, willing hearts to bring that which they had to the, to the temple in order to give it as a sacrifice and sacrificially give. Lord, a person can sacrificially give of their time, of their effort to be a servant in, in this RU ministry that uh, you've started here at Bible Baptist Church. Father, I do pray for the unreached groups of all over the world. There's many of them that we don't even know about. But I know I serve a great God that he don't let one of them go unnoticed any day that he creates. And he knows exactly what's going on. And Lord, one day we'll get to see the fruits of many, many soldiers for you out there that have stood, that have spread the gospel. And Father, I, we're looking forward to that day when uh, the soldiers will be all gathered together as one. And, and Lord, in your kingdom, and, and Father, uh, it will be great rejoicing. Father, I do pray for Stacy Anderson that you'll help her. And Lord, this uh, uh, physical condition that she's in and Lord, what she's having to go through, and Father, we do cry out for you to you because we do know that you're the great physician. We do know that there's uh, people that's been on our cancer list and and for for years, and been on our uh, other lists in our prayer guide, that uh, our salvation lists and many other lists that that uh, they've been put on, and Lord, they seem to pop up there every week, every week. But Father, we know that you're working, and we know that you never sleep and that you're working on people's hearts. And the Lord, that the salvation list is probably the most important in your eyes because that's what your son died for on the cross. So Lord, I just depend on you. And if we expect to hear some good reports of people who have been uh, uh, healed, who have been um, saved out of uh, us uh, bringing our prayers to you. And Lord, we like to hear them because we like to stand up and give you the credit and give you the glory and give you the honor because Lord you deserve it you, you of all people deserve it, our all and you deserve to have all the all the uh, glory for anything that's done here at Bible Baptist Church and all over the world Lord I do pray for our nation Lord that you'll bring us back to you to God that you, you'll uh, uh, help us to uh, repent and turn back and father it does seem bleak it does seem uh, like uh, things are getting bad but, uh, Father, every generation can say that. And, Lord, uh, we depend on you, but give us the strength to spread your gospel. Lord, uh, today might be the day that you come. Tomorrow might be. But, Lord, until that, give us the strength each day to stand up and proclaim your son, Jesus, as uh, 
as John the Baptist proclaimed you, and when you first stepped on the scene, and uh, he proclaimed, and behold the light of the world. And Lord, I, we help us to proclaim that light that still shines bright and that liveth forever. Father, I do thank you for this church, the work that goes on here. I thank you for our pastor and his wife and Lord, to all the workers that put in uh, uh, tireless effort uh, from, from uh, the song leading clear down to the people who serve in the nursery. And uh, Lord, I, I pray for each and every ministry here. Give us strength to serve you and to be a shining light for you that people will look on Bible Baptist Church and they'll, they'll be amazed at what is going on here, not because of the people, but because of the God we serve. Now, Father, as we come tonight and we open up your word, the most important thing is that time when your word is opened, your word is preached, and your word is taught. Lord, help us to have itching ears that want to hear the truth, that want to, our toes stepped on sometimes, that we uh, can bow to you and cry out to you and repent to you. And, and Lord, just uh, uh, learn from you. And Father, I, I know that, uh, that the one teaching uh, desires to be used of you. And I ask, Father, that you would help him to give uh, just as what you have said on his heart tonight to give us. And Father, may the Holy Spirit work in each and every one of our hearts. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 91 in your hymnal, 91, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. <clears throat> Would you stand with me again as we sing? There is coming a day, there is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. Happy go. Face, the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be amen great one another make somebody feel welcome we'll come back and sing that last stanza together
my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burden to bear. Let's sing that last together. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burden to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with that one who died for me. What a day. singing. You may be seated. Ushers will come and get our offering tonight. Give as God has blessed and prospered you and let's ask God's blessing on our giving tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege to give and Lord, thank you for a people that give for Lord, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And Lord, I pray that our heart would be in the work of God and in the things of God and our treasure would reflect that. Bless the offering tonight. Use it for your glory and for your honor to further the ministry of the gospel through Bible Baptist Church. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Go to Titus chapter 2, please. Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus in chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, <clears throat> to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, 
showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may, they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture passage here this evening, and as we open up your word to once again study it, we desire that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, Father, open our understanding and help us all to to glean uh, from this passage tonight what you would have us to glean and learn what we need to learn. Lord, I pray that each of us would be able to be aware and conscious that we all adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. We all adorn the gospel. And Lord, help us to advertise the gospel the way it ought to be. Now, Father, bless our study this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. An amazing statement, verse number 10. Look there with me, if you would. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. It, it, it's, it's amazing, not just adorn the doctrine of God our Savior, but adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. All right? It's always a, more of a challenge when he throws an all in there. Okay? And, and we have a all things. You know, it's, it, that's, a, that's an amazing statement. <clears throat> because we have a great gospel already. In fact, the Bible calls it not just salvation. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect So great a salvation. And it is a great salvation that we have. So great. Hey, so great that if I died right now, if I had a pain come through my chest and I fell over on the platform and and Danny Wright rushes up here and he says, he's dead. He's gone. You know what? Immediately I'd be in heaven. Immediately I'd be with the Lord Jesus. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's a great salvation, my friend. Immediately in heaven. So great, how great was the salvation? So great that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. How great was the salvation? So great that that Son would come and live a perfect and a sinless life here on this earth. How, How great a salvation? So great that He would be beaten and He would be scourged. How great a salvation? So great salvation that He would be taken and nailed to a cross to be crucified for you and for me. How great a salvation? So great that God had placed all of our sins upon Jesus Christ while He suffered on the cross. Uh, so great that He would die and be buried in His borrowed tomb, and yet so great salvation that three days later, God raises Him from the dead. And so great salvation that 40 days after that, He ascends back to heaven where He sits at the right hand of God to make intercession for you and for me. So great salvation that He's coming back for us one day. He's going to come back and receive us unto Himself that where He is, there we may be also. So great salvation that uh, after, after the tribulation period, He's going to come back to earth with us. And we're going to set up a ruling. He's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And guess what? We're going to rule and reign with Him. We're going to rule and reign in this world. Christians, hey... Jesus is going to be running things. What a different world that's going to be, amen? What a great time we'll have when that happens. So great that after that a thousand years, the the devil is going to be cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, and he'll be tormented forever and ever and ever. 
And so great there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem is going to come from, down from God out of heaven. And it's going to be a marvelous, marvelous eternity. I mean, think about that time. It, we, there's going to be no hospitals. There's not going to be any cemeteries. There's not going to be any jails. No need for all you inside. Amen. No doctors. No tears. Some of you who live daily with pain. No pain. No sorrow. No, no, no television. Sorry. No rock music. No immorality. No immodesty. No cursing. I tell you what, we have a great gospel. We have a great gospel. And yet, the amazing thing is that that's, that's tremendous enough and it's great enough, but God says it needs adorning. Now, adorning is a word that means decorating. It means embellishing, if you will. It means to decorate. It means to make beautiful. It means to add to beauty by dress. It means to deck with external ornaments. That's literally what the word adorn means. <clears throat> um, just like sometimes you, you know, you wonder sometimes that they'll, when you get a nice meal served sometimes, they'll, they'll put the, the meal on there and then they'll put a little green thing on there. You think, what's this green thing doing here? Well, that's just uh, parsley. And all that does is just adds color to the plate. You're just, it's just an adornment, okay? I guess you can eat that stuff. I, don't, I never have, but I guess you're supposed to, and you could. But I just kind of set that adorning aside. But it's supposed to make it look pretty. Your, your, your Christmas tree always looks prettier decorated than it does when all the decorations come off the tree. You see, adorning, adorning. A painting can oftentimes completely be changed depending on what frame you put it in and the kind of frame that it has. What's that? Adorning. Even though it could be a beautiful picture. A solo is good. A solo can be even better with the right accompaniment, with the right person accompanying the person singing the solo. So we as Christians, listen, we're to make the gospel a reality to people. You have to understand our responsibility. And until it becomes alive in our lives, then it's still just a concept or an idea to other people. Just a viewpoint that you have. It doesn't really mean anything to them. But listen, when, when the saving power of Jesus Christ, when it reaches down into your soul and He cleanses you from your sin, and, and you know that you've been set free, and that you now have the power over sin. Not just the penalty of sin, but the power over the, 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 the working of sin in your life. And then, then listen, the, the salvation that you possess no longer is just a, a, a viewpoint or just a concept. It becomes a reality in your life. And other people take notice. And then they begin to listen and look at what you have. You see, most of the time the world doesn't look at Christianity. It, it, looks at it, it looks at it as a necessity. Not as something that is supposed to be enjoyable. In other words, why do I have to be a Christian? Well, if you don't want to die and go to hell, you've got to be a Christian. Well, alright. I'll be a Christian and then I'll just grip my teeth and bear it. Because I don't want to go to hell. But that's not Christianity. It, they don't view Christianity as very attractive or pleasant. Am I right? That's why, that's why how many times do you invite somebody to come to church with you before you finally get them to come to church? And a lot of times, you don't get them to come to church unless there's something special going on. Then, then because of that, that allurement or that enticement, they'll maybe come. There's no attraction otherwise. And so understand that most people, their attraction to Christianity is just because they don't want to go to hell. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good beginner. That's a good start. But there's so much more to Christianity than just missing hell. And we have to make sure that we adorn the gospel that way. Eternal life, listen, the Christianity is more than just eternal life. Christianity is also supposed to be an abundant life now. Jesus, I've come to you, you might have life, but you also might have it more abundantly. And the problem we have sometimes is that the idea that people get from Christians is that the Christian life just isn't real great. 
I mean, we don't really enjoy it. We just kind of get through it. And we, we kind of become poor advertisements for Christianity. Poor advertisements for the gospel. Every one of us, every Christian, is a living, breathing advertisement for Christianity. You're a living, breathing advertisement for Jesus Christ everywhere you go. And so we're to adorn the gospel. And so God says it's a great gospel, it's a great salvation, but it's even better when we adorn it. Now, there's only two times in the Bible the word adorning is used. It's used here in Titus, and it's used in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9, where the Bible says that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's, again, when a, so when a woman does not adorn herself modestly, she's not a credit to the gospel. Boy, that's, that went over big, didn't it? All right. Is this on? When a woman does not adorn herself modestly, you're not a credit to the gospel. Okay? I, don't don't get, look at me that way. It's in the book. Look at 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9. It's there. And so we, we, we think of different ways. And by the way, men, man thinks of different ways to adorn the gospel. Sometimes they think that we adorn the gospel with soft organ music in the background throughout the service. But that's not adorning the gospel. Are we adorning the gospel with stained glass windows? And are we think to adorn the gospel with actors and drama? Are we think to adorn the gospel with rock and roll and having a band? That's not adorning the gospel. We're going to find out how to adorn the gospel this evening, okay? In very practical, very simple terms that uh, Paul gave to Titus here. And by the way, let me let me set a little background for you here. Paul is writing to Titus, and Titus is pastoring in a place called Crete. And remember, the the Cretans, if you remember, I think it's in Philippians, Paul talks about it, maybe in Titus here, where he talks about how they're they're evil and they're, they're, they're liars and they're, I mean, they were just not a good place. And Titus wanted to leave, and he said, no, you stay in Crete. You stay there because they need you. And what he's teaching them is they need the gospel, but more than they need the gospel, but they're, they're going to listen to the gospel not just by what you say, but they're hearing the gospel by how you live. And you better make sure that you live this way, Titus, so they'll listen to what you say. And so he's, it's important to learn how to adorn the gospel. And if we, hey, if Crete was wicked, uh, we live in a wicked age as well. We live in a difficult age as, uh, also. And now, I want you to notice, first of all, verse 9. He says, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. First of all, it identifies who we are. What are we? We're servants. If you're saved, i got news for you, you're a servant of Jesus Christ. You're a servant of Christ. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Over again, in, in each one of Paul's epistles, when he starts out the epistle, he almost always starts it out with Paul a servant of Jesus Christ. He always reminded him. Do you think he forget, forgot that? No, he's reminding himself that he's a servant. What do you think I am? A slave? Yeah. I think I am. Just so everybody's servant? Yeah. That's what we are. We're servants. When we get to thinking we're more than that, then pride has come in. And you're headed for a fall. Okay? So we're servants. Now, <clears throat> in fact, it was one of the one of the, uh, who was it who came over here to America and, and he, he, he viewed all that America had and, and he, he made the statement, I would have become a Christian were it not for Christians. How sad a statement is that? Hmm? Oftentimes we have to be, again, are we, are we adorning the gospel? Are we advertising the gospel as we should? Now, let's look, let's look what he said. Here we are, servants. That's us. Okay? Here, here's what we do. Number one, be obedient to their own masters. Number one, you do it by being obedient. Obedience is being submissive to authority, yielding compliance with commands. Obedience is, is, is following orders or injunctions. It's performing what's required. And by the way, it's speaking here 
in the workplace. A good day's work for a good day's pay. You know what he's saying? You want to adorn the gospel? Be obedient to the people you work for. Be obedient to the people you work for. If you do not work, and you don't, you're not compliant with what the, your, your company asks you to do, your bosses ask you to do, what your employees ask you to do, and you don't follow their injunctions and follow their commands, and you're not a good worker, do me a favor, will you? Don't tell them where you go to church. Okay? Because that's a poor reflection on Christianity, and it's a poor reflection on Bible Baptist Church. Be a worker. Be a producer. Why? Because you're adorning the gospel. That's why. You're adorning the gospel. There'll be more influence. Listen, the people you work with are more influenced to come to Christ by your hard work and by your diligence than they will be by you quoting the Bible to them while they're working. Okay. Should you have tracks? Absolutely. Should you have, can you have your Bible within your pocket? Sure you can. But you don't pass out tracks and you don't read the Bible when you're supposed to be working. Because that's company time. And that's when you're supposed to be producing for your employer. Obedient. Servants, be obedient. And be obedient to the people you work for. And so that's, that, that's the first way we adorn the gospel. Pretty practical, isn't it? Pretty where the rubber meets the road. But he's not done. He doesn't just say be obedient. Notice what he says secondly. And to please them well in all things, not answering again. So please them well. Be well pleasing. You see, well pleasing moves beyond obedience. It moves beyond, okay, I'm, why am I doing this? Because he told me this is what I had to do. Okay? That's obedience. Again, we're talking about on the job. We're talking about where we work. 1 John 3 and verse 22. You're not far from there. Would you hold a finger in Titus and just flip to the right and go back to 1 John 3? 1 John 3 is a great prayer promise here in verse 22. 1 John 3 and verse 22. It's a great prayer promise, but it explains here to the difference All right, between obedience and doing what's pleasing in His sight. Notice it says in verse 22 of 1 John 3, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments. What's that, church? Obedience. We keep His commandments. That's what? Obedience. Now, He doesn't stop there. And do those things that are pleasing in His sight. That's going beyond just... This is, what I, this is what he told me to do. Okay? It is going above and beyond and doing things that you know need to get done and you know ought to be done, but just because somebody didn't tell you to do it, then you don't want to do it. It's going ahead and doing it because you know that needs to be done and probably he'd like that to be done. And I'm going to do that. So at work, you go the extra mile. At work, you seek to be pleasing in the sight of your employer. And by the way, pleasing in the sight of your Lord. As I said earlier, it's okay to carry tracts and carry your New Testament and you can talk about Jesus when the opportunity arises. But listen, you can't do that and then snap and be rude to co-workers on the job. It'll ruin, it ruins your testimony and it doesn't adorn the gospel. If you desire, listen, you desire to be well pleasing in his sight. The Bible says you don't go about your job just to be a man pleaser. There's all everybody who's ever worked a job has been around guys who work hard when the foreman's coming through. Or when somebody from management's walking through. Then they're acting like they're very busy and they're working hard and wiping sweat off their brow. But any other time when they're not around, they're trying to shoot the breeze with somebody or talk or waste time or do something else. They're just men pleasers. Listen, we work hard because we know we're, we're not just trying to please men, though I, we want to please the people we're working for, but the ultimate pleasure we're working for is God's pleasure. We're here to please the Lord. 
And He's always watching. He always sees what we do. He's always looking upon us. And so we're going to be courteous and we're going to be kind. You know why? That adorns the Gospel. We're going to go on and do something that, that may not be required and may not have been commanded, but we think it would, it would be good and they would want it to be done, so we're going to do that. When, when, the job is, is when, you're, when you have downtime on a job, do you just stand around with your hands in your pockets and sit in a circle with everybody else and, and talk about the, the, the management like everybody else does? Or do you just find something to do that may need to get done extra that would help things? You said, man, they taught us growing up that when I worked in a, in a factory, boy, if your machine broke down or you had something else, you know what you did? You got a broom and you started sweeping. I mean, you just kept busy doing something and, and make it profitable. So he said, be obedient, be well-pleasing. And then, verse 9, he also says this, please them well in all things, not answering again. Oh, boy. You know what that is? Not talking back. Not talking back. Gainsaying is where we say something for our gain. And that's usually what happens when we want to talk back. We're trying to get the last word in. And oftentimes it's, it's mumbled under our breath or it's said to somebody else after the boss has gone away. That's talking back. That's answering again whether it's the boss or the foreman or other workers. What it is, is listen, it's no gossip, it's no criticism, it's no complaining. Philippians 2 and verse 14 comes to mind, to do all things without murmurings and disputings. Why well, do you want me to do this? This is stupid. Doing this thing, I don't know what, what they think this is any. Well, I think they ought to be doing it this way. You know what it means? It means keeping your opinion to yourself. It means having enough respect. Hey, parent, think about it this way, parent. How would you like it if your child treated you that way? If your child always talked back and, oh, you want me to do this. Oh, this is stupid. What am I doing this? You wouldn't put up with that. You would, you would like him to say this. I'd like to think this. As a child, if, if they knew what you knew, they would be making the same decision that you're making. Now, they don't know what you know, and they don't understand all that you know. And so let's carry that over to where we work and figure that, you know what? I don't know everything that they know, but if I knew everything they knew, I'd probably be making the same decision they're making. Let's just do the job. Let's just do what they're, let's just do what they're telling us to do. That's just having enough respect for your authority and, and not answering again. Not offering my opinion about everything. Okay? can tell this is popular adorning the gospel is always gracious and courteous kind and helpful it's a it's a it's having a meekness the the meekness is the ability to negotiate among others without causing friction and sometimes you have to help in work environments to help others negotiate with others without causing friction. When everything's going well, and hey, you say in, in a sports term, you know, when, when uh, in fact, you, you Cincinnati Reds baseball fans, some of you here, right? You go back, at, probably before you were born back there, but uh, back in the 70s, and they were winning the world championships uh, every year, they were called the Big Red Machine. Why, everything just operated like a well-oiled machine. We use that terminology, don't we? And so, you want to be able to be that lubricant that makes sure that things operate like a well-oiled machine. And you can throw a wrench in the work, so to speak. You can throw some sand in there and some grit to make everything, everything grind and, and begin to put people against each other. Or you can be the oil that can make it smooth out and not be the cause of that. Not answering again. Not answering again. Just, hey, you, you, you learn to be quiet and do your work. 
Be quiet and do your work. Be quiet and do your work. Okay? Not answering again. Let's go to number four. Now number four, he says, not purloining. Well, that's a, that's a word that you're, you don't usually use today, is it? When's the last time you said, now, when, as, you're, as you go off to work, now I've got to make sure I don't do any purloining today. Huh? No, you don't think about that word, do you? You know what the word purloin, purloining means? Purloining means, very simply, stealing. Stealing. Holding, it, it literally can be holding back part of the price. We know anybody who held back part of the price in the Bible? Uh, maybe around Acts chapter 5? A couple, a couple had some property and sold it. And they told everybody how much they sold it for, but they held back part of the price. How did God feel about that? <laughs> Pretty serious, wasn't it? Cost them both their life. And it, and it means, and, and by the way, you, you, you say, oh, I would never steal from my employer. Oh, wait a minute. When, you, when it comes time for break time and you start breaking about 10 minutes early, because, you know, you've got to start easing into the break. And then the, you sit in the break room until the bell rings, the buzzer rings to get back to work, and, and then you start packing things up, start putting things together, and it's another 10 minutes till you get back to work. And your 10-minute break became about a 25-minute break. Some of you are shaking your heads. You've worked in places like that before. It's universal. That is not, listen, that, that's, that's the way that, that, that the normal man looks at it. You know what that is? That's stealing from your employer. You're stealing time. And time is money. And it's no different if, hey, if your employee, if your employer on your paycheck deducted that out of your, and took that money away from you, you'd be hollering about it. But don't you take it away from him. You see, it means being honest. It means being predictable. It means that you're not sometimes early and sometimes late, and you may show up and you may not show up. Nobody knows for sure. That's not purloining. The gospel is adorned. The gospel is framed by honest workers. Be friendly, work hard, be courteous, pay your debts. If you don't, listen, if you don't, they're not going to listen to your gospel. They're not going to listen to you tell them about Jesus. Not purloining. Number five. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. Fidelity is faithfulness. Faithful. Dependable, steadfast, reliable. Dependable, steadfast, reliable. Honest, hardworking. Not critical. And people will notice there's something different about you. John Coleman, you, you worked, how many years at the company where you worked? 34 years. How many days of work did you miss? How many, how long, you had a streak, didn't you, where you didn't miss any work? How long was it? Carol, do you know? 14 years and never missed one day of work. I'd say that's pretty faithful. Let me ask you a question. Did you ever have days you went to work when you didn't feel good? <laughs> you bet. I'm sure in 14 years you had to. Hmm? But it's no surprise, is it, that Coleman's are here every service? You see, establish how could he be faithful to a job and not be faithful to his Lord? Hmm? How, can you be, how can you be faithful to your job and be there every day, five days or six days a week, 
and not be faithful to the Lord and not be faithful to your church. Showing all good fidelity, all good faithfulness, steadfast, uh, not, not, not ever uh, de- being dependable. That's hard to find these days. Talk about people who are hiring people, people who, who work people, any of you who are, have any kind of management position in your company, you know how hard it is to find people who just, be, who just show up every day. And you can count on the, the guys being there to work. Difficult. If you just get someone who would just show up every day and be faithful every day and, and, and want to work hard every day and be honest every day and, and, and not try to, to cheat the company and not try to uh, talk and give their opinion all, all day long, but just be quiet and work and labor. Man, that's a valuable asset. And when you have someone like that, people notice there's something different about you. We were in college and we lived in a Little, uh, it was a, it was. <laughs> if you ever been through Hammond and and some of uh, Chicago areas kind of like that, they they have streets where the houses sit on the street, and then behind the houses they'll have the backyard, and then they'll have sometimes a, like a detached garage back there, and that's where an alley would run behind all the houses, and that's where all the trash cans were and such, and that's where the garbage trucks go down that alley and dump all the trash. You didn't pull it out to the curb like we have to at our house or anything like that. It was already back there in the alley, and you just, they just came through and would empty it. Well, this, this fellow had built like a garage in the back, and he decided that instead of making it a garage, he would make it into a little one-bedroom apartment. And that's where we lived when we were at Bible college. We lived in that little garage. And, and, and it was about, and, and it, <laughs> it was just a slab, and, they put some linoleum over top of it and uh, put some carpeting in the uh, what was what we used the living room and uh, there was a little bathroom there and such and uh, that was uh, th- they had a bedroom that wasn't I don't, it was it wasn't as big as this little side room over here uh, that that if you ever been in that music room there and um, that's where we lived and I remember the the last we were there January uh, of nineteen would have been January of 82. It was below zero every Sunday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning of that January. And it culminated with the last Saturday night, Sunday morning, and it was 22 below zero. That was the temperature. And the wind chill was 80 below zero. There was, there was ice on the inside of our windows. And I remember Brother Taylor, it sat back there, and when the yard, the way it ran, when we'd have a rainstorm, it would want to come in the, the kitchen door and flood the kitchen. And I remember many times in rainstorm, I'm outside digging trenches trying to get the water to run away from coming in the house. And, but you know what? That was, that was our home. That's where we lived. And uh, we had our first bed was that it was a couch that sat like this. And when you put the back of it forward, you know, it would go click, 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 and then you could lay it down. And then we, that, that was our bed. And it had this side where everybody sat on all the time had a spring that, was, that would stick up. So it was always who'd get in bed first to get the side that didn't have that spring sticking up. Amen. <laughs> Memories, huh? But that's where we lived. And, you know, and paid 195 a month, I think it was for that. What was it? 175 a month with, uh, and the utilities included on that. Hard to believe now, isn't it? But you know, the we were graduating, and it was uh, maybe a month or so. I think it, if I remember right, a month, maybe two months before we were going to be leaving after graduation from college, and our landlord's name was Jeff, and. He came in to see us, and he said, I want to talk to you. And he, and he said this. He said, I've watched how you've lived. You lived there for two years. He said, your wife is happy. You've never complained. You always pay your rent on time. He said, I've seen what you live and what you live with. 
And he said this, I want what you have. I want what you have. Now, he didn't mean the apartment. <laughs> sure of that. But you know what? We got to see he and his wife receive Christ as their Savior. And we had never sat down and tried to give the gospel to him. Maybe we should have. But they weren't, maybe they wouldn't have listened. Maybe they needed to see somebody adorn the gospel. Now, lest you think we're some great Christians, I'm sure there's been many folks we've disappointed through the years as well by not adorning it as we should. But, but some people, that's what, they're, that's what they're looking for. They're looking to see somebody live it. And, and somebody adorn the gospel. And the question tonight is, how do you adorn the gospel? Are you, what kind of advertisement are you for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you attracting people to Christ because of the way you live? Or do you have people say, huh, if, that's, if that's Christianity, you can have that. Hmm? Obedient, well-pleasing, not answering again, not purloining, which means what? Not stealing. And faithful, showing all good fidelity. Being faithful in what you do. Be consistent for the Lord. Because as you do that, you adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Let's, let's adorn the gospel in everything we do. Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth this evening. Lord, thank you for the plainness here of Titus chapter 2. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that Paul gives to a young preacher who's a little bit discouraged in the city that he's in to say, stay with it and don't just preach it, but live it. And Lord, I pray you'd help each of us tonight to live the gospel we believe to adorn the gospel that we adore. Father, I pray that it would impact the lives of others. There'd be others who would look and say, you know what, I want what you have. I want what you have. Father, help us to adorn the gospel or to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Make us that kind of a people, Lord, that would be pleasing in your sight and would draw people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we pray you'll dismiss us with your care tonight. Make us mindful that you go with us from this place. Father, I do pray that you'll continue to be with Jarvis as they travel, continue to be with the Reeds as they head out early in the morning. Please give the rest of us safety, all of us as we travel towards El Paso, Lord, and the other group that's going to be coming from Wisconsin. Please watch over them and give them safety in their travels as well. Get us all there safely, Lord, and then prepare the hearts, our hearts and the hearts of the people we'll minister to in Mexico, that we'll see a, just a multitude of people come to know Christ as their personal Savior. May your hand rest upon it and rest upon the folks that are here. Keep them faithful. Keep them staying by the stuff. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground. Let's sing it together, all right? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You are dismissed. Choir, no.